Leviticus chapter 15. And that's where we are today as we've been going through the Word of God, which I think is the way you ought to be preaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had at first said, we're just going to hit the highlights. There are no specific highlights that you can hit in the book of Leviticus. In order to hit really all that needs to be covered, then you're going to have to look at the whole book. And so that's why we have been going through this really verse by verse. And that's okay. There's some of the chapters in the Bible that are a blast to, to teach. They're, they're fun to teach. Uh, res when you deal with the resurrection, that's a great chapter to teach. When you deal with the sacrifice of Christ, Isaiah 53, John 3, Psalms 23. Well, all those got threes on them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Genesis chapter 22. These are chapters that really are fun to teach from. Uh, but then there's other chapters that you really would just rather avoid. Uh, and uh, this one's one of those. And, and I'll just read you the first two verses. In Leviticus 15, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh. Now, the, the word issue there can be discharge. I mean, who, <laughs> when you read that, you just sort of want to stop. Uh, what? What? And, and basically, I, I look at this chapter, and I, I sort of say, this is a yuck chapter. But this is where we're at. And if we're going to go through the Word of God, we've got to go through the Word of God. And you say, well, I thought we already covered the yuck chapters. <laughs> chapter 13 and chapter 14, dealing with leprosy. We did. And we're going to look at why we're here and where we're at and why we're studying this today. There's a reason that God put this in the Word of God. Okay? Uh, do we believe that all Scripture are inspired by God? We are a church that believes in expounding the Word of God, preaching doctrine, and really preaching expository. Verse by verse. Because there's a reason for that. Uh, the, the text navigates us through the truth. And I'd rather be navigated by the text in the truth than you be navigated by me in the truth because if you do, my truth sometimes may be false. And so I'd rather go that way. And this is whatever is on the heart of God. When you go in verse by verse and chapter by chapter, you are going through what is on the very heart of God. Now, when I first started out preaching, that's not the way I preached. Uh, I, when I first became pastor of this church, that was not always the way I preached. A lot of times when, uh, when I first became pastor of the church, I would preach whatever on Sunday morning I felt like. On Sunday night, I would cover topics, and on Wednesday night, I would go verse by verse. Since then, I've changed my philosophy. I've changed the way I preach. One, I found out that it's easier for me to just preach through the Word of God. I know what I'm going to preach next. I know where I need to be studying next. And I'm not waiting all week long for something just to enlighten me to show me what I'm supposed to speak on on Sunday mornings. And so I've decided this is the way to go. And after studying and looking at other churches and listening to other preachers, I feel like this is where we're going to grow more and we're, we're going to know more of the Word of God. And it, it might not be as exciting as getting up here and preaching on some uh, specific topic. And today, I, 
thought about preaching on the independence, but that's not where God led me. God said, let's continue on where we're at. And so where we're at is the up chapter. Okay? Uh, but I want to refresh your mind just a little bit of where we've come and how we've gotten to, where, to this chapter. First of all, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God's problem. All of Leviticus is profitable. Okay? Uh, study of Leviticus, as we said at the very beginning, unlocks books of the Scripture. Other books. Uh, the, the study of Leviticus, if you don't have a proper understanding of this book, you'll never have a proper understanding of the book of Hebrews. And the reason a lot of people misinterpret the book of Hebrews is because they do not have a proper understanding of the book of Leviticus. And, and that is done that way. Uh, this book reveals the presence of God in every aspect of life. We've talked about the way we worship. We've talked about what we eat. We've talked about uh, what is on the skin. Today, we're going to talk about what comes out of the body. God's interested in it all. Do you understand? God's interested in you completely. Every bit of you, God's interested. Uh, this book, uh, Undo Wrong Practices of Worship, if you listen to it. It underscores the holiness of God. Um, in, in a review of this, understanding also that this book takes place in one geographic location. It's the only book that does that. This is the only book in the Old Testament that you really see it was in one place, especially with the children of Israel, and that was it. We start in Mount Sinai, we end in Mount Sinai. And so the first 10 chapters are about worship. That's the vertical part of this book. Now, chapter 15, 11 through 15 is about our walk and our relationship with others. And that's our horizontal life. So it's your vertical life, you and God, your horizontal life, you and other people. And so that's what it deals with. Uh, the first seven chapters were about sacrifices. There were seven. You had the burnt, the grain, the peace, the sin, the trespass. And then you had uh, how it was confronted with the principle that I need a sacrifice. And so we had those. Chapter 8 through 10 dealt with principle. I need a priest, someone to, be re to represent me before God. Chapter uh, 11 through 15 dealing with the horizontal. What food can you eat? What is produced by the body? Children. Now, chapter 15, the yuck chapter, okay? Uh, you, you say, well, I thought that was leprosy, and, and that's obvious. Leprosy is that, that's obvious to people. At first, it's not, but eventually, that leprosy is going to be obvious to everyone. And leprosy, of course, is a type of sin. Bodily discharge is one that is pride. Now, there's some bodily discharge that we're going to talk about that is due to sin. There's some that's not. But this deals with that if you want to look at the leprosy part of sin, it's obvious to everybody else. Does this not deal with some of the things that are private, nobody else knows, and some of it is sin? Is this not important? As we look at this, uh, God wants to be a part of of your private life too. Do you understand that? God doesn't want to just be a part of your public life. He also wants to be a part of your private life. Is that not a principle that we will see in this chapter? Even though it's a yuck chapter, there's principles here that I think can help guide us in our life. Uh, we'll have a public life and we'll have a private life. God wants to be a part of it. Uh, David prayed for the Lord to cleanse him from secret faults, secret sins, in Psalms 19 and Psalms 51. Um, 
religion deals with the outward going through rituals, attending church, giving, serving. That's what that deals with. But God is interested in the heart. The inward parts. And you did see a lot of that as God in sacrificing deals with some of the inward parts of the sacrifices. Right? And God said through Isaiah that he hated the feast days and the sacrifices. But why? Because our hearts weren't right in doing. And, and so God said, I can't do away with them. i got to have them. Why did God have to have them? So that they would understand when Christ came, what it was all about. So it had to be. Uh, they would uh, say one thing, do another. Their hearts weren't in it. And you can't live your life as a Christian that way. You can't do that. Um, these are principles we see. So we, we come to the first part of this chapter. It deals with bodily discharge. Now you say, why do we got to talk about this? Because God's talking about it. It's not something I really want to come out here and talk about, okay? Uh, it's not something that I say, okay, this is exciting. And I wanted to skip over this. I wanted to say, let's not do this. Let's skip it. Let's go on. But that's not being consistent with what we believe here at our church, is it? If we believe all scripture is profitable, then this has got to be profitable. To be honest, I've never heard anybody really preach from this chapter. Uh, I listened to a couple guys this week preach from this chapter, and, and to be honest, that's where I got a lot of my ideas and a lot of my, my notes and things like that because I, I, I had to search it. I had to search through and, and, and find some people uh, and, and, and things that I felt like would be on the same page with me and that would be uh, legitimate in this. And I found that a lot of time it's the Calvary Chapel people that I can listen to who believe in preaching expository sermons. And, and so in verse number one, we've already read, but we'll read it again. And the Lord spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue or discharge out of his flesh, because of his issue he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his issue, whether his flesh run with the issue or his flesh be stopped from the issue, it is his uncleanness. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean, and everything whereon he setteth shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. But he that setteth on anything whereon he sat, that hath the issue, shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the evening. God knew water was cleanser, right? Yeah. And he that touches the flesh of him, that hath the issue, shall wash his clothes, and bathe him in water, and be unclean until the evening. And if he that hath the issue, this is gross, spit upon him that is clean. I mean, this is pretty, pretty, pretty de detailed then. Then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And what saddle soever he rideth upon that hath the issue shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening. And he that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whosoever he toucheth that hath the issue and hath not rinsed his hands in water. See, you ought to wash your hands, folks. Uh, he shall wash his clothes and bathe him in water and be unclean until the evening. Be careful who you shake hands with. That's what he says. 
Uh, and the vessels of earth that he toucheth, which hath the issue, shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. They understand their vessels were made out of clay, and clay absorbs some of this stuff. That's why they had to be broken. Okay? 13, and when he that hath an issue is cleansed of the, his issue, then he shall number to himself seven days of his cleansing and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. And on the eighth day, he shall take to him two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, and come before the Lord unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and give them unto the priest, and the priest shall offer them, the one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord for his issue. Now, that's a lot, right? Uh, that, that's a lot. So this principle that we see here uh, the, in the first seven verses deals with discharge basically from a venereal disease. Okay? That's what this one's dealing with. Uh, and, and because there is a sin offering offered, then there was something that was wrong. Okay? Do you understand because there's some here where there's a discharge and there's not a sin offering. So this is basically what we can see is it's dealing with a venereal disease. Which is a result usually of sin. Okay? And, uh, and again, like I said, we're going to deal with this kind of stuff again on Sunday. I mean Wednesday night because that is where we're at in our study there in the Bible. And so this deals with that. Uh, this is an area that uh, God is saying you need to be careful what you touch. You need to be careful with this. And, and here, here's what I want you to understand. God doesn't say that what he's touched is unclean for seven days. He says until the evening. You know why? God knows how long a venereal disease exposed to air lasts. It only lasts six hours. Okay? The exposure of that only lasts six hours. That's why you need to be careful when you go to uh, bathrooms and stuff. Cover the seats. Because whatever, if somebody has a disease like this, it's alive for six hours. And so he says if he sits on a saddle... If he lies on the bed, if he sits in a chair, if he spits on you. Those are things that needs to be careful. In other words, be careful who you kiss. Because when you kiss, they're getting spit on you. You've got to be careful is what he's saying. And uh, so this was something that was a problem in Israel. You know why? Because there was a prostitution going on during those days. There's some things like that happening. And especially before they got into the wilderness. And some of them probably caught some things back in Egypt and carried it with them. Just because you get saved doesn't mean the things that you had in your body before, if it was disease, it's gone away with. You say, well, but God forgives me. Yeah, but the results are still there. God does cleanse us, but we still have to face the consequences of our sin even after our sins have been forgiven. I say it this way, and I'll say it again. If you can make sure you get to God before the hand of judgment starts, I believe God will stop it. But if once the hand of judgment starts, you can get all the forgiveness you want, but that doesn't mean you're going to stop the hand of judgment. I believe that's true. I believe you can see that in the Word of God. Uh, and, and we'll give you some examples of that later on, even today. And so God begins to see some of these things that are happening. Uh, God sees that there's a question why, and, and our question is, why are we here? Because it's dealing with blood and water right here. That's what it's dealing with. 
uh, believe that the work of God is done by the Word of God, right? That's how the work of God. And we are washed and cleansed by the Word of God, right? Blood and water. The Holy Spirit, the blood of Christ, right? Conviction of our sin through the Holy Spirit. Forgiveness through the blood of Christ. And so the, the first thing in the morning, we ought to start out with the Word of God to get our cleansing. Right? Jesus, we see, washed his disciples. And the Bible is clear right here as we see how the cleansing of water is there. Jesus washed his disciples. He washed their feet. And, of course, Peter put his mic foot in his mouth and he said oh I don't need to be cleansed he said yeah you do Peter if you're not uh, washed with me you're not clean and he said well bathe my whole body he said Peter that's not what you need right now there's a good message there the whole body didn't need to be bathed because the body had already been cleansed you don't need to be re-saved You just need somehow wash your feet because they get dirty out there. We've talked about that already. And I think there's a symbolism there that talks about that. He says you are cleansed from sin when you are saved, but you walk in the world and your feet get dirty. So we've got to wash it by the Word of God. That's why there needs to be a daily cleansing. Not that you get saved daily. You get saved once, and that's it. Look at verse number 16 and 18. This one is a little different. Okay? 16 18. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh and water and be clean until evening. And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. The woman also with whom uh, man shall lie with seed of compupulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. What's compupulation? Semen. Okay? That's what he's talking about. So, but there's no sacrifice made here because the marriage bed is undefiled. Well, you say he's unclean. Well, that's because there was some fluids that came from his body. We are unclean. Okay? So he says you're unclean to the even. So th those are some of the things we begin to see here where God is so interesting and interested. In other words, God says there ought to be some cleansing even after something like that is done. You ought to clean yourself. And, and so these are some things. This is normal activities within marriage. There is no offering that is required, so there's no sin that's been committed. But yet, there's so many Christians that still believe it's a sin, and they think it's dirty, and it's not dirty. It's part of what God wants. Okay? Why unclean unto even? Even the most normal, natural God-given things are tainted by sin. And we live in a sinful world. There probably was a day it wasn't unclean at the beginning before sin. But now it's tainted. And everything has been tainted by sin. Uh, I, I, I believe that there's probably, when, when in the Garden of Eden, do, we believe, do you think that Adam and Eve had sex in the Garden of Eden? I do. Do you believe it was unclean then? No. But now it is unclean, even though it is a legitimate thing. It's unclean because it's been so tainted by sin. Because of the thought life of man. And the thought life of woman. Because of the elements that are in our world of uncleanness through sin. And so therefore these things or to be this way. Look at verse number 19 through 24. Now we're going to deal with, uh, <clears throat> you'll see. Okay? Uh, and if a woman have an issue, and her issue in her flesh be blood, 
she shall be put apart seven days, and whosoever toucheth her shall be unclean unto the evening. And everything that she lieth upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she setteth upon shall be unclean. And whosoever toucheth her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean to the evening. And whosoever toucheth anything that she set upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean to the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything wherein she setteth, when he toucheth it, he shall be unclean to the evening. And if many man lie with her at all, and her flowers be upon him, and he shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed whereon he lies shall be unclean. Now, what's this deal with? The menstrual cycle. The issue of blood. And, and so, this is normal. Is there a sin offering? No. No sin offering. So, therefore, no sin. Now, here's the thing. Why every woman, as you look here, is treated like leprosy when she's on the menstrual cycle. Why? Why is it that way? One, it's a monthly reminder of the fall. Did a woman have a menstrual cycle before the fall? I doubt it. I think the fall brought it upon her. Because there was no kind of decay or anything during that time, right? You ever thought about that? There's no kind of decay. Why is there a menstrual cycle? It's to clean, to refresh. There was no decay, so there was need to be no cleaning or refreshing. And so during this time is uh, one of those things that, as you see it, uh, it's a reminder. It's also, it talks about separation of God from the people. This is the reminder of the separation that sin brings. A separation of that. That the world is tainted with sin and impurity. And it's also a good practice within the marriage for the guy to give his wife some space. I'm going to tell you she needs it. That's what God's trying to say. Give her some space, boys. <laughs> Stay away from her. How long does it usually last? Seven days. Seven days. God to redo all that. You didn't know that God was interested in your menstrual cycle, did you? <laughs> you say, I've never heard a preacher talk about menstrual cycles in the church. No. God did. Is all scripture not profitable? Why is it there? There's a reason for that. And so, therefore, it is not sin. It's a result of sin. I really believe that. Look at verse number 25. Get off that subject. Okay? And if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it run beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed whereon she lieth all the days of her issue shall be upon unto her as the bed of separation, and whatsoever she setteth upon shall be unclean in the uncleanness of her separation, and whosoever touches those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean to the evening. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days, and after that she shall be unclean. So that's 14 days, actually. Or, no, a little, little different. And on the eighth day, she shall take unto her two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them unto the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. The priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. This is dealing with the burial season of 
In other words, it shouldn't last more than seven days. There's a problem. Um, it, it, now, we have a lot of other issues uh, that can cause some of that that's not venereal diseases today. Uh, but this was the basic facts of that. Um, and so basically, there was a uh, taking a chronic flow. Uh, and, and so, and there's a, perhaps, like I said, it, there was a venereal disease. Uh, it's abnormal. It's lasting longer. A sacrifice is required. So therefore, in the Word of God, it's foreseen as being a sin, right? Okay? I'm just going by the Word of God. I'm not saying that every time something like that happens is a sin, okay? Um, sin, because of sin, other things have developed. I think at that time, a lot of these other problems that women were having probably had not developed by, yet, by that time. I don't think there was cancer in those days. I, I don't know if there was tumors and stuff like that during those days. Uh, but these were some of the things that were going on. Um, so the, the, we, have a, we have a place in the New Testament where we see this. Remember the woman who had an issue for 12 months? And Jesus is coming through and she decides she's going to touch the fringe of his garment. And he says, something left me. Who touched me? And this woman had heard the story how Jesus had touched others and been healed. And she figured, well, if I could touch him, I'll be healed. And so she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment. Just those little tassels. And there was a cleansing that came. And Jesus felt the, the thing come from him. The power and everything came from him. And she was healed, right? There's a possibility she had a venereal disease is a possibility of what she could have had. In those days, that's what that was considered, some kind of thing like that. And faith in Jesus was the thing, not faith in the garment. Okay? That's not what it is. So look, Leviticus acted out in the New Testament as we see it, right? Mm -hmm. Did, after that, did she go and probably make a sacrifice and everything? She probably didn't. I can't remember, I haven't read all the story, but I, I want, did Jesus tell her to do that? Brother Lee, or do you know? Uh, it's, I, don't. I don't, I can't remember. Luke chapter 8, 43. That's where that's found. Then, look at 31 through 33. Thus shall you separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness, that they died not in their uncleanness, when they defile my temple that is among them. This is the law of him that hath an issue, and of him whose seed goeth from him, and is defiled therewith. And of her that is sick of her flowers, and of him that hath an issue of the man, and of the woman, and of him that lieth with her husband, with her that is unclean. Now, this is talking about the defilement of the temple. In other words, the issue don't just defile the person. These issues don't just defile the person. Um, it defiles the church corporately. Do you understand that when you live an immoral life outside the church, it affects the church. Is that what it's saying? Defiles the temple. And people think, well, I live however I want. I'm glad we don't have a big church. <laughs> Sometimes you got a big church, you've got some defilement in there. Uh, I'm not saying we don't, but hopefully we don't. <laughs> uh, but the, the fact is, is that it's one of the issues that can come like that. And the Bible says, hey, if you're that way, don't go to church. Uh-oh. Did I say something wrong? The church is supposed to just accept everybody, Brother Lee, right? <laughs> well, we're under the age of grace. Yeah, we are. 
but there's still some principles of the Word of God that's there. If you're that way, get right before you come to church. Now, we want you to come to church. We want you to get right. We do. And I'm not trying to keep anybody from church. I'm just preaching the Word of God. And I know there's probably some people that's tuned out now. And that's okay. If you don't want to go by the Word of God, that's your business. And that is also something that you'll have to face when it comes to God. Let me give you an example. God's concerned about the church, and God's concerned about you personally. This is about fellowship. My personal sin can affect everyone else. Remember the story, Joshua chapter 7? Oh, Achan sees a garment. He likes it. He's thinking, well, I can look, I'd look good in that. So he takes it. They were told not to take anything, right? But he takes it. And as he takes it, he hides it under his tent. They go to Ai. They go to fight in Ai. An unwalled city. They just fought a city with a wall and won. Here's an unwalled city. That's what Ai means. And they go to fight them, and they turn around and run back, and 36 men are killed. Joshua gets down. What's wrong here? Well, first of all, we see where I believe Joshua sinned because he didn't go with them. He just sort of laid back. He didn't really pray about it. And so Joshua now goes to the Lord and repents, and, and God says, You're sinning in the camp. And they began to name them, go all the way down, until they finally got to Achan. God gave Achan a chance to repent before the hand of judgment started. The hand of judgment started. Achan began to repent, but it was too late. And because it was too late, the whole congregation of Israel were affected. But not only that, his family was affected. His wife, his children, his livestock, his servants, everybody was stoned to death. Why? Because of his sin. Was it a private sin? Yes. But did his private sin affect the congregation of Israel? Yes. Can I tell you, your private sins will affect this church. We want you to stay right. I want you to look right outside in the pub, but I want you to look right inside your house because it's going to affect this church. It's important. And, and so these are some of the things. Now, I'm going to stop there, even though I was going to get into chapter 16. We can get into that next week. And we're going to be looking at Yom Kippur. That's the holiest time of Israel. That's the day when the priest went into the Holy of Holies. This year, Yom Kippur is September the 27th for Israel. Okay? Uh, every year they still have Yom Kippur. Even though they don't have a tabernacle and all that, that is their holiest of all days. And that's when the priest entered the Holy of Holies. And so we'll deal a little more with that because I think that's different than this thing of uh, bodily fluids. Uh, we'll make it through the yuck chapter. Hopefully it wasn't too yuck for you. Um, but the fact is, is God's concerned about those things, is he not? If he wasn't, he wouldn't write about it. And so because he wrote about it, we see that he is concerned about those things. In other words, leprosy was an outward sin everybody could see. But some of these bodily fluid things that happen are some private sins that nobody sees. Some of them are not sin. Some of it was. It all depends on what happened before the discharge. So don't be discharged in the wrong way. <laughs> I know that's gross, and your preacher can be gross like that at times. But the fact is, is God is very concerned about your private life. Your private life affects your wife. It affects your husband. It affects everybody around you. Anybody that's close to you, 
If they're sitting on something, if they touch something you touched, all that stuff has been contaminated. Sin contaminates. Doesn't affect just you. It also affects the congregation. The tabernacle. Sin, even privately, affects others. Let's be careful. Let's stay in the Word of God. Let's stay right. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for everything you do. I pray that you'll help us to stay right, to be where we're supposed to be, to stay in the Word of God, and to preach the Word of God in His truth, His principles, His doctrines. In Jesus' name. Quickly, I'll tell you the story because it is.